Welcome back. I think I'm live, don't you? Nope. Welcome back to the first taped, well, I guess we've taped a couple episodes before, but the first taped live in the same time slot interactive clip show from the STD podcast. Tonight, if you're watching this tonight at 9.30 Eastern, 2.30 British time, I'm uh, camping with my son. There's a Boy Scout thing. So we're doing that, but, you know, I'm not going to miss the show. So in typical variety show style, we shall do a clip show with me talking interspersed with other crap. Now, a lot of you have been coming on, you know, the subbing count has been increased a lot more in the past year or so. So a lot of you guys don't remember, you know, the origins of the show. Basically, in April of 19, I decided a lot of these open mics were getting a little stale. I wanted to take my talents to YouTube. So I figured the best way to do that at the time was, you know, get the typical four white dudes sitting around a table talking about everything podcast. So I hit up my buddy Don, who I had done a comedy show with the year before in 2018. This guy Tom I work with, and this guy Pat, who was a little bit raw, but uh, Hernan's friend, I kind of know him, he's still a friend of mine. And contacted up, we all met at the bar, fatheads up there, right down the street from me, just like the Marines did in Ton Tavern back in 1775. And we came up with the ideas for the show and kicked around. I bought all the equipment. And we started out, first show, well, some of you have seen this because it's a popular clip, but May 17th, 2019, was me, Tom, Don, and Pat. Check out how it turned out. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the STD Podcast. I am here today with Tom, Tom and Joe, baby. And, Joe, and Pat. And Pat. Let's, Let's kick it off with Tom. Tom. Uh, my name's Tom. I'm uh, married with uh, two kids, two little kids, and uh, doing this for some fun. Pat? My name's Pat. I'm a bachelor, single man, single man of the group. Uh, love pop culture, music, movies, entertainment, movie, uh, TV. Go Browns. Go Indians. Go Cavs. Right? Go Cavs. What's up, players? My name's Joe. Y'all know me. This is my garage. You feel free to get pick shit in the background. We're just having a fun blast here. Welcome to the Don. Rock it, baby. All right. Welcome to the first episode of the Square Table Degenerates. As the title says, today. We haven't changed a bit, have we? <laughs> well, except the fact, Don, you know, since divorced, been a couple of relationships, now another relationship. Pat's now not a bachelor, and Tommy has three kids. But other than that, everything's exactly the same, including the studio, right? I'm just kidding. We've grown quite a bit since then. Man, that was uh, pretty humble origins. When we first started, we were talking, we thought we were going to talk about controversial topics, you know, hard-hitting shit. We learned, you know, early on that people don't want that. People want to shut their brain off and just be entertained. You know, and we're entertaining. You know, you smoke weed, you're going to get entertaining. You just talk about it, so... We just started talking about crazy shit. And some of you may remember my buddy, Brian. He had this, uh, he's a real big conspiracy theorist. And a couple months into the show, I think it was episode 15, he came over and Tom was there. My buddy Tom, you've seen Tom on the first clip there. He talked with Brian about flat earth. And this is one of the more classic debates you are ever going to see in on our show. This is uh, quite amazing, actually. Let's uh, bring this pull up here big here and enjoy this. You're going to like this one. So this, I got to set the scene. It's uh, 2015, or 2019 is episode 15, like it says. And I, I, knew, I, knew, I knew how Brian was and I knew how Tom was. So I wanted to get, get the party started and instigate. And I had to go to the bathroom this time. So it, just uh, enjoy, enjoy this. This is great. This is great. He's, I, now, let me ask you this. Are you still a flat earther? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 100%. Man. How? How? It's, it's right, let, me, let me let me let me let me go. It's fucking 2019. I'm gonna go, right, I'm gonna go right, into so, more water. So how been right, hanging right, on right, since 2010, right. dude? Like, so how, how? What what evidence do you need? To not because be flat we earth still earth. haven't gone but beyond between here and the moon. Okay, that's could, totally different. A lot of flat earthers don't believe in the the space station. I believe they're up there. I believe you can see the space station travel. Right, I believe that. I, I, I believe they're up there. 
I, I actually yeah. believe them guys are up there. And, and okay. flat earthers don't believe that. But even there, from their point of view, okay. you ask them to look so, out the window, it's going to be flat. It's not going to be no ball. So that's what I'm saying. Somewhere along the line. So how are you line, a flat earther if you believe that the, the because space Because I believe in science. I believe in actual science. Meters by meters. Okay. Miles by miles. Uh, gas, weight, density, okay. all this shit. I believe in it. Oh, okay, good. Gla gravity is a made up word. Okay. Astrophysicists, they love the thought of gravity. As I as do I. Deep down. Okay. What's the keeping what's Pluto, keeping you on the earth? Huh? What's keeping you on the density. earth? Density. 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 As soon as our blood goes cold and it stops beating, our, our body falls to the ground and okay. becomes pavement and right. whatever. Right. Everything, everything that so we make. So density, like buoyancy. A everything, everything that we make. So why? Everything that we make that comes up from the ground comes from density. We put uh, electrical charges, oils. I don't think gas. we're using density the same. No, the everything, same way. Every, even the trees. The trees, like how they say, the trees give off oxygen right. to the atmosphere that right. causes fucking clouds. Oh, okay. Okay. Clouds causes rain. Right. Rain but, but, causes but density. Is everything and buoyancy, yep. right? Are related. So if something's more that dense. Has nothing to do the with only, gravity. Only reason why it sinks is because of gravity. No, no. It what is, is gravity? What is gravity? A force that pulls two things together that have mass. Right. right. Dumb. Yeah. Garlic. Does that mean that there's a planet spinning so fast that it's sucking everything down to to the bottom of it? Because that's what gravity is. That's the, no, it's because but, it has mass. But they can measure it, but they still don't know what it is. Because it's about it's not about gravity. It's about density. Every Everything in our world, in our dimension, is dense. Everything we build up is from different materials. Right. From trees and electronics and stuff from the sky. And okay, stuff I think we're going in completely different directions. No, no, no. Here. It's everything that goes on. Because as soon as our blood and everything starts pumping and moving in our bodies, it dies. Just like birds and everything. It's like blood pumping, energy right. pumping from the ground. Everything that we pull. Down, we got several, it's not gravity. Several it's not because this world is doing this. this is it doesn't, spinning doesn't spinning matter. We're in a terrarium. Dude. Spinning doesn't matter. We got ice cream cake. And it, okay, all right, let me ask you this. Cake. Go to the edge of Lake Erie. Why can't you see Canada? My because I don't have good enough glasses. It's small enough. Okay. Girl, girl, and because the, the density and clouds and weather of that far you can see. But if I had, on a, if I if I, I stood on a well, nice shoot, shoot hill, out, Don, if you still have time, shoot on, out, on a, on a, a fact, If I stood on a nice hill and I got a good telescope, I could see real, real far. Right. If I got higher, I could see even farther. If I got higher, I can see even farther. Because of the curvature the high, of the Earth. Okay, but at, at, at some point, curvature means that you cannot see that far. Right, because you get so far away, you don't right. see half of the Earth. Right, so the higher you go. Sphere. Right, no, okay. No, but the higher you go, the farther you can see, right? Right, until a certain point. No, at what point? The higher you go, the farther you can see. Right, and so you can see only half of a sphere. But it's never been proven to be a sphere. It's it has not, been. No, no, yes, it has. There's pictures. That's what the, exactly. That's what I said. And it don't. It doesn't exist. The curvature of the Earth does not exist. It does when you, exist. No, I show you the. I'll show you the. When they ISS it. right now, it goes seventeen thousand five hundred miles around the globe. Right. It circulates the Earth ninety-one times a day. The it's globe, 20, exactly of the globe. The globe but every time sphere. it goes that high, it's never shown a sphere. It's going around the North because, Pole really fast, like this. Because it's close to the Earth. No, the Earth is this big. No, the I'm Earth is this I'm big. Back. The ISS is back. like this far right. away. And I thought I would see these things. These things do not exist. They do. There's N pictures. No, look it up right now. I can look it up. The, the sh naval, <laughs> naval ships, no, the, when they fire the, when they fire weapons, they go they 100 and some 200 miles over the curvature of the Earth because they don't. They go straight in a straight line. They have, they have to account right, for the curvature of the Earth when they fire weapons. They don't. Giant? No. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
It's it not your movie world. guy. I'm I can't. You, the further you see, is the fur- they never see over the horizon, dude. Because it's, it's the curved. Best. No, if, if the Earth is flat, dude, I, I can look and see. Yeah. The and look and look and this is where I there's there's this flat is I took all two, over the globe, right? This is where I took two steps back. This is where I took two steps okay. back. Okay. Okay. This is because why do they always use water? Because water's not level. It's level onto a point in a cup. But I can't measure a cup. But why do they always use water? So let's take two steps back. Because it's no, wa- what, water, is, on, on. water is self-leveling. Is so, exactly. Right, right. But if it's on a big giant sphere. Wait, wait, wait. That's right. If you started digging a hole right so now. He's agreeing with me. It's a sphere. Yeah, it's a globe. I, it's no, a sphere. No, I'm not why a, are we I'm arguing saying he's a flat because earth? Because this is where I was telling myself is that this is where science should take it. It it's does. Because if we're it's 20, there. No, if we're 24,900 miles in circumference, and you should be able to ma- measure eight inches per squared mile, that means after every fucking certain mile, you shouldn't be able to see so many. Yeah, miles. I can give you three right. uh, three examples of the curvature okay, of Okay, no, wait, no, 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 slow down, slow down. You got to take two steps back, man. You got to take two. Mount Everest, okay. all this shit. You okay. got to think, okay, if I am really, if Earth <laughs> is really the size of Jupiter, at some point in time, if it's like you know, we are Earth, and they okay, say that okay, we're okay, twenty-four thousand. If it's the size of Jupiter, right? If, if we okay. are, if Earth, if if Earth is twenty-four thousand nine hundred miles in circumference, which is good week. <laughs> no, listen, this is okay. If Earth is twenty-four thousand nine hundred miles in circumference, with all the water depths and all, and they say that we're like seventy percent okay, water. Then, uh, uh, you know what I mean? They're saying that Earth is 70% water. 70% you know? of the surface is covered in water. Water. Right. Okay. Okay. And it, it, But only, only like 1% of the mass so is actually I take water. Two steps back. So you're already uh, imagine eight inches per mile square. So you can go that high up and you still can't see the curvature of the earth. Uh, the higher you go, the you further you can see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's true. So we already mixed that. Because the higher you could go, the further you could see. Right. So if I go higher, if I go higher, uh, I'm really I'm right. doing math. Make sure, stay, make sure you're staying in frame because this is this is good. Right, right. If I go higher, I could see further. Yeah, you're not the shot. Yeah. So I I, so I, have, like I have to take three steps back. I have to really tell okay, myself. We're really stepping back here. Yeah, we, yeah. We're a mathematician. We're I'm in the, about we're in the uh, back. We're all right. Junior high, high school math. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Right. Okay. Just basic. All right. Algebra. And right. Like that. Okay. And we're measuring all the uh, things from Mount Everest and Thailand and uh, the what they was telling us about what's in the center of the Earth, the uh, the the inside of the our core. core yes. And fucking uh, hot red sun and it's spinning really fast around. Hot high red sun. Okay. Which is Provides uh, a magnetic, magnetic field, field, yes, from uh, north and south pole, right? And stuff like that. So you really got to take two steps back, okay? And then you Wait do back. your math on that. You do your math on just that, okay? You know what I mean, off us being a certain circumference, whether it's twenty four thousand nine hundred miles in, in circumference, or it's a hundred and twenty four thousand. You got to sit back down the way you see your head, man. Or, yeah, or it's or it's one million. One million. I mean, you can't just like make up random numbers. And but, say, no, you're whatever. trying to do actual science right. and numbers. Okay. How okay. far can okay. you go just to see? Okay. Our own okay. Because we can't perceive nothing. The furthest <laughs> distance that we can see is from uh, 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 water. Classic debate there between Tom and Brian. You can check that out. That was uh, episode 15 a couple years back. It's in the archives. Yeah, after a while, you know, we kind of, you know, just kept doing it, the show, kept going with random topics. We had people over, guys like RJ and Brenda and shit like that. We'd get friends over, you know, typically have the four guys. We, you know, eat the chicken wings and four guys. If one person wasn't there, you know, no big deal. We'd sub out. But once uh, once COVID hit, man, obviously we had to, the last episode we had was with Champ the Dog. And right after that, COVID popped. And we were, you know, obviously we couldn't meet up. So that's when I just figured, found StreamYard. And I fell in love with StreamYard from the rip, from the rip. I really dug it. We did a couple of shows that were virtual, same style, just we're all in boxes instead of around a table. 
And that's when I, you know, in the first part of the show, I started, we used to do a lot of William Hung jokes because the joke was if William Hung could, you know, be good, then we can make it. And once we got StreamYard, I was like, man, I should randomly reach. I got baked. That's how I get all my guests if you want to just get baked and think of shit. But I think I was like, man, I should reach out to William Hung. So I just fucking DM'd him totally out of the blue. And to my shock, he, he responded, man. And so I remember it was 4 20 20. It was right at the pandemic. We were all in the house. Everything was closed down. So enjoy this first ever celeb interview. You guys, some of you, most of you have seen this before. Some of you haven't. But this was William Hung uh, last year. It was me, Pat, and Mr. Hung. So enjoy this here. Hold on. Oh, shit. Let me uh, share this properly. Stand by. Should I have this queued up before? My bad. All right, enjoy this because Pat was on here too. It was really fun. And watch how think of the interviews I've done recently, and then watch how when we first started, how how crazy it was. All right, we're here with the Square Table Degenerates podcast. I'm Joe Varel. This is Pat Bolger. We're here with joining William Hung today. How are you today, I'm Pat sir? Bolger. Nice to meet you, sir. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you all. Good deal. How are you doing today, Mr. Hung? Uh, I'm doing very well. Good deal. Can we call you William? Where do you go by? Yeah, yeah, yeah. William, Will, whatever, whichever you prefer. <laughs> okay, good deal, good deal. Well, let me tell you a little bit about our show real quick. We, are, uh, we have four guys, and we run a live podcast. Typically, it's out of my garage, a little podcast studio we got here in Cleveland. And, uh, you know, traditionally, we all get together in my garage and do it, but now we're doing it remote because of the, the shutdown. And we figured, you know, we like – we from, from the start of the show – we always liked you for because of the way you just went up into places and just said, you know, I don't care. I'm just going to do this. And I really like doing this. You don't care about it. So from the beginning of the, from the beginning, when, he, when we started our show, we always, uh, we always talked about you in a lot of different episodes, just as a, you know, joke with the show. Cause you know, if, if he can do it, we can do it. We can succeed all that. So it's an honor to have you on today. Uh, uh, you, you are indeed an inspiration to us, sir. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Yeah, how, when you uh, you uh, we was, we did some sis, serious research here and studying you. It says you grew up in Hong Kong and then came to Jersey. One, uh, how do you remember much about growing up in Hong Kong? How was it out there? Uh, yeah, I I was born there. I lived there with my parents for about ten years. Uh, it it was it it was interesting from uh, from my childhood experience was my love for video games. I remember that I was a, when I was a kid, I would love to beat Super Mario Brothers. I oh, immediately, nice. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and there's, there was all these kids standing in line. And whenever you lose a life, you have to go back to the end of the line. So mm -hmm. I, 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 was, I was frustrated because I, I don't like going back to the end of the line. I, I just want to keep playing and nobody else gets to play. I, I want to win the game. And eventually, back then, there's no strategy guide, there's no YouTube. I figured out how to beat the entire game without losing a life, and and then, and then people were, and and everybody was watching it all. <laughs> that was no, one of the best feelings ever. No warp levels either, right? You just no warp levels. You just you just keep no. I beat down. every That's level it. fair and square. <laughs> oh, nice, 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 nice. nice. Now, which 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 of the Mario Brothers is your favorite? Did you like one, two, or three of the best out of the original ones? Um, I would say number one. I play I I I played both uh, uh number two and number three, but I'm not a big fan of number two. I, I like number three. Number three is fun too. I like number oh, yeah. two is always well, number two is always randomly my favorite just because I like the the princess and she can just float across everything. <laughs> oh, you can, oh, you can yeah, fly. Yeah. That's you true. Can fly with the raccoon tail. That's yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I like about the three. I like to fly with the raccoon tail. Yo. And I and I okay now was, and let's get into some uh, some college stuff here because uh yeah. and, and Hong Kong school but I, I noticed you went to Berkeley and I'm I'm a really big fan of Berkeley and uh -huh. you went there you were there in the early 2000s when did you start Berkeley I started around 2004 John 3, 2004. 2004 were you there when Aaron Rodgers was there or did he leave by then huh Aaron Rodgers the football player did we. Quarterback there when he was Packers. there. Did he, oh did he yeah, yeah. I, I I forgot, but I I remember I was watching him. Yeah, I think he was still playing for Berkeley. I I remember my friends okay. and I were watching him. Okay, yeah, because he gra he graduated or he was uh, right around the same time. I think you were on Idol. He was getting drafted by the yeah, yeah, yeah. by the yeah. 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 Okay. That's right. Uh, what what originally made you decide to try out for American Idol? Like, what? How did you figure out the show was even coming to your area, and what happened? Well, uh, yeah, that's that's why I share my experience on video games because because I love 
to do something in life where there's no uh, set rules. Uh, I want to excel in my own creative way. Uh, so so that's, that's what happened. And then I was studying for civil engineering. I thought math and science was for me, but it turned out that I was struggling. I wasn't happy. And so one day I saw this poster for a talent show in school. And then I, I started watching and studying music videos from Ricky Martin's She Bangs. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't expect anything, but somehow I won the talent show. I got the DVD player. So that's what gave me the confidence to audition. Nice. Now, what, nice. when, when, when you good. were, what year of school were you in when you decided to, to go? Now, did, did you, it, it, setting your thing, you just dropped out or what happened there? How many credit uh, hours did you have? Uh, I was on my second year. Uh, oh, so okay. I had a long way to go. Okay. So you still had a lot of time yet. You, it wasn't like you were like, you know, three credit hours away. No. And then you, okay. Okay. So that's a, that's a reasonable risk there. Now, what when you were on the when 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 you told people about this? Did you tell your parents about it? Did anybody say, you know what, this is too risky? This is insane. You're crazy. No, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't not including my parents because if, if if I told my parents, they would say no. So you just drove. You just drove. Where where was it? Where was the auditions being held? And and how far? Uh, it was wasn't. It, it was San Francisco. It wasn't that far, but okay. I had to take take a take a train in the morning. Okay, yeah, because I've, I've, well, I've, I've been to Berkeley and I've been to, uh, to San Francisco. So that's what, about a half hour drive, 45 minutes, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. cool. So uh, now you were on, at, 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 I don't really care about the, the show itself. I mean, you've done that a hundred times. But after the show is what intrigues me a lot about about what you had going on. It says here on your Wiki page, you were interviewed on Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, bear with me while I read, read down these shows, because this is cr quite an impressive resume here, in my opinion. Jimmy Kimmel Live. On Air with Ryan Seacrest, Entertainment Tonight, George Lopez, The Late Show with David Letterman, Countdown with Keith Olbermann. I remember that. It was a long time ago. Howard yeah. Stern Radio Show, The Ellen DeGeneres <laughs> Show, Dateline NBC, Arrested Development, and CBS's Early Show. Now, yeah. what of those shows would you say, was, did you, was there any of those shows you regretted doing? You're like, nah, I shouldn't have came out here and done this. I mean, it was kind of like, you probably don't remember half of it because it was so bang, bang, fast paced. You know what I mean? And yeah, I would say Howard Stern uh, because I didn't choose that one. The record oh. company put me on that one, <laughs> and they made, he made me feel very uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, I, I remember. I remember Howard Stern. He would always do it. He, would just, he, he asked questions that you don't want to answer. He's like, I'm gonna answer. That's ridiculous. You also any were there any uh, any shows that people that you saw that were like in real life? They're a lot different than you thought they were on the show. Like you went up there and like, oh wow, that guy's really mean, or that lady's really nice, or something like that. It's hard to tell. I couldn't tell. I think I think Ryan, I think Simon, uh, Randy, and Paula—they're pretty much who they are. But I also know that they were just playing their roles on the show. Uh, so the roles they play—they definitely match their personality. Like Simon being the mean and brutal the other guy. Uh, yeah. So, but but uh, but I feel that there's something in genuine, not genuine about them. Like like. Like if you were to tell me Simon is this mean guy outside of the TVs and 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 interviews, I wouldn't believe it. And may, and not, and over the years, he revealed uh, that he's he's a uh, he's much more mellow. He's much nicer now compared to the past. Okay, okay. Now, Pat, you were going to ask him about uh, some. There's something. Uh, hold on. The once one. Uh, well, oh, the real one. quick. I. Yeah, I'm sorry. Real quick. I, I don't know if you mentioned this show. Um. You also made an appearance in Arrested Development, right? Which is like one of the greatest sitcoms. <laughs> yeah, of all time. Back then, yeah. How well, was that I, experience? It was all right. I mean, it, it was it was just a very short short segment. Right, right. That's that's, that's one of my own personal favorites. I had to bring that up. So. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. Yeah. No, no. Say, say you did something like that. You know, you were you were you're going to be in a five minute TV segment or something. How long of that is it? Like a multiple day process? How long does that take? Like, how long would you be there at the studio? Uh, that one took a, a a full day, so it's just a lot of waiting, a lot of retakes. Yeah, it, it's yeah, it, it it's uh, it's all. I mean, it it happens. It's part of the, the doing this kind of business, and it's something that most people uh, don't don't know from the outside. You know, oh, it's yeah. a lot of it's a lot of the 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 back behind the scenes stuff. I mean, the fun part is actually doing it. it whether it's the singing, the speaking, the performing, the hard the, the the part is not so much fun. It's all the behind the scenes crap. <laughs> there's always so much waiting and stuff like that because they film some movies i work in downtown cleveland and they, they filmed they like fast and the furious and all that and, and you see these people and they'll they'll have like three a three minute segment but they're waiting around for seven eight nine ten hours just starving and just getting paid nothing it's so ridiculous on some of that yeah i know 
Now I also now the the record deal also intrigued me too. Now how soon after your performance and how did they come up to you with this? Did they just say, hey, you know, what's up? Here's a record deal, or how did that come about? Uh, it came about because one of my fans, uh, Don Chin, created a website called WilliamHung.net back then, okay. and it got over eight million hits in less than a month. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's how I got the the record company interested. They reached out to me. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't ask for that. Like they, uh, they told me, "Hey, William, uh, I heard about this on the news, so we're gonna take a chance on you. We want to give you twenty five thousand dollars for a record contract." Wow. <laughs> back, back, how old, how old were you when this happened? 22, 23, something like that? 20. 20, 20 years old. Wow, you got 25 20 grand on there. That's awesome. Now, yeah. how long did it take? I read oh, you man. recorded three albums. Did you do them all at once or were they like separate one back to back or how'd that work? Uh, they, separate? It's, it's, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, was there any song that you, that you really liked doing or one of your favorites on there or this kind of all whatever? Uh, uh, I, I I like just do it. It's not a popular song from my album, but but I like the, like I like how it's original. I feel that I like the message be, be, uh, behind that song uh, compared to she bangs because my my all every time uh, <laughs> I they, my fans want me to to sing it. If if I don't sing that song, they they don't want to pay me. They don't want me there. So. <laughs> right, 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 right. That's so like, so like, come on, I can say more than that. I'm more than that song. <laughs> now, do you get do you get royalties on something like that? Like, say they, I, I don't know if, even if they play your songs on the radio, but like, say you know somebody downloaded your version of Shebangs or or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I I used to get uh, royalties up front, uh, uh, but but now you know it's very minimal. Uh, and I, I technically I still get them. But a lot of them just goes back to the the market marketing expenses from the record company. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, they fronted you the money, so they probably like whatever what they. Have, I feel like. I feel yeah, like. yeah, right, right. Now, did you? Uh, yeah. Did you? What I saw, I saw you online that you, that you played some poker and you had a lot of poker stuff going on. Did you? Do you still play poker? Are you still, still a fan of that, or this kind of was that in the past, or how's it? What's up with that? Oh, I, I, I poker is is part of my identity. It still is right now. Uh, I would say. That if we ask me, if people ask me what I do now exactly at this moment in time, I would tell them professional poker player. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What, what uh, what got you into no. poker? Was that how far, how long after Idol were, did you, were you into poker and you just said, you know, this is awesome? Um, I started around the same time, maybe a year after I got famous from American Idol. I remember I got invited to perform at a casino in Reno. And then I got more satisfaction winning a couple hundred bucks from poker, where, uh, compared to making five figures from this from the performing gig. What was your What was your Do you remember the hand you had to, for winning that? Is it? Um, I remember I got aces and kings multiple times. <laughs> nice, nice. Do you, what was What's your favorite poker game? You like hold them, hold them. My, I, I yeah, definitely them. hold them. Yeah. Okay, that's what that's the way I do it. That's the way I do it. So. This kind of segues into what I was going to ask you. So, are you playing with with, with everything that's going around within the world with Corona? Um, I don't know if you're confined to your home or whatnot. No, are you yeah, that's part of it. With okay, so you're keeping yourself busy with a lot of like. This is how you're keeping yourself busy online poker. Like, what are you doing to keep yourself uh, sane during all this going on? Are yeah, recording I would, or I would say, I would say the 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 most important thing is actually to continue to show up to your audience. You know, doing mm. uh, interviews like this one, many, many mm. webinars, podcast mm. interviews, okay. uh, still staying connected with friends. Uh, and then, of course, I do put in a lot of hours for, for mm. my poker, uh, like at least like 25 to 30 hours a week. Uh, okay. I, put in, I put in time to I put, make time to study every single day, uh, mm. you know, for the common situations that come up, figure out how to improve my play. So, yes. yeah, I would say I would say that, you know, I take it very seriously. But at the same time. I need to find that balance. It's not a specific number, but I don't feel that, you know, I poker should be my only thing. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Now, when, you, when you're, I was, I was going to ask you a question about poker. You, you, now, do you feel it's because, you, did you get into poker because you're, you said you start, you're studying it and studying your strategies and all that. Is that because yeah. of your math, math background and your, your, your regular job and all that? You just, you're very analytical. <laughs> that's what I get like with fantasy football. I like, I like create charts and I like seeing a lot of this stuff. So it's really uh -huh. numbers based games. Is that how you got into that? Is that what, what drives you in that? I would I would say that's definitely part of it, but but the other part of it was like I said earlier. I I, I still don't know how how long um I'll play poker. I can't say it will be with the rest of my life, but I but I feel poker is one of the few games where I could excel in my own 
creative way. Uh, be because even though there's a lot of math, there's a lot of um, charts involved, uh, there's still a lot of room for you to make make the best play based on what you know about the opponent. Because okay. a, lot, a lot of times, I feel, I, 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 now here's, here's, really, here's this dirty secret. And it's not some secret, right? It's not some secret uh -oh. you've never heard of. Okay, the secret is to play the man in front of you. The secret is to make foes or make calls that nobody else can make based on the given situation. But it's based on sound, logical reasoning. Now, when you play, do you wear the wear the sunglasses? No. And all that, or, <laughs> I don't think the same thing. Yeah. No. The stereotypical. Uh, what I like doing when I'm playing poker, I like, I, I, this is, I mean, I don't like playing in casinos so much because you know they got all these rules and i'm not really a big rules guy like like you said i'm the, we our show we just do whatever it's kind of free for all but when i play poker i don't i would always like try to engage the other people in conversation like i'll start talking hey where you from man what's up buddy how you doing stuff like that because if they're distracted you know that that i could focus and you know see what i'm doing from there but a lot of casinos don't like that and people don't some people are stark social at the poker table either you know what i mean yeah yeah Good deal, man. So what? Uh, now you had you had a book that just came out. Uh, I I was reading some of it. I can't. Yeah, hold on one second. I think I closed the link. Um, I got. Can I got it. Yeah. Can you, what's? Can you tell us a little about the a little bit about the book? I was reading some of the three C's and all that. What's uh, what's yeah, what's yeah. the book about? And That's how did how did you? Well, first off, who came up to you with an idea for a book, and how did that come about? Well, the book is called Champion by Choice. I came up with the idea. Um, okay. because, so the way I at the, I got that inspiration was what I spoke at a conference in Texas a couple of years ago, and their theme of the conference was champion by choice. Uh, uh, and then I was thinking, wow, that's that resonates with me uh, because I feel that people chose me to be the champion, even though I know I'm not the most talented with my music. With my with my speaking or anything else in life. Okay, I mean, so these, what, uh, go ahead. So the three C's is that something that you always live by, or is that something that you created for the book, or is that something is that a guideline you put out for yourself? Yeah, so I would career? say it come it comes from my um, the American Idol life experience uh, from the last fifteen years. So the three C's uh, are, the first one is communication. How do you choose to communicate? I feel that, that even though there's no like, you no know, hard evidence, like why I got the uh, tremendous popularity, I believe the main reason was how I responded to Simon Cowell. You know, when Simon said, okay. you can't sing, you can't dance, what do you want me to say? And I, I said, I already gave my best. I have no regrets at all. And you know what? And you know what? I commend you for that, man, because other people, I probably would crack under that, you know, if that was me and he's saying, but I commend you, man. The way you held yourself in front of him, that, that was that was fantastic, I thought, man. You, right. You, you, you didn't you, go you in just, there. And a lot of these people, they just go in there, they start kissing his ass. Oh, Mr. Cole, how you doing, buddy? You, know, you just go in there, you do your thing, let them see what you got. And if they don't like it, yeah. then, if not, then you go. You know, that's, that's beautiful. You just attack it and you're awesome in there, man. Yeah, you you held your own, man. I I like that. Okay. Yeah, it, it comes from a, like that just genuine um, positive attitude, right? It wasn't it wasn't something that I scripted in advance. It was just how I felt, and then and then the context uh, is seeing the big picture for the situation, understanding what's going on, and like I said, the judges were just playing their roles. You know, they're not attacking me personally. They have to do what they have to do. So that's why I was a, it's easier for me to stay positive. And I feel that a lot of people are, are you know, for, also forget the big picture. Like for me, I, I just give you a like, like quick example that's happening to me right now. Um, uh, I, played, I played poker for the last 15 years. Uh, and I just transitioned to online poker because I have to, right? Because of the whole <laughs> corona, right? Oh, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, because I have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's been tough. It's been tough. I, I mean, I'm doing okay, but I had my biggest downswing throughout last last seven days. It was nightmare. It's, be, it's right. beyond any amount that people can imagine. Uh, but, uh, but I took a step back and then I see the big picture. I've done, I've done very well for myself in my life before to even be able to afford this kind of downswing, right? I, I see the big picture is that, well, I, I'm going to create a bigger impact way beyond poker. 
you know, something with, with and then my, so I work with friends and mentors and they told me, well, William, think about the impact that you want to make. It's not about the money. Think about the impact. And so, yeah, I figure out it's, it's going to be something related to gaming and then speaking, something about expressing yourself in your own unique way. So, yeah, it's all about seeing the big picture. So if, you, if, you're, if your listeners are struggling to figure out what they want to do with their life, you know, they, they're down on themselves. Hey, I, I, I could be down on myself, too. I was. Uh, I'm, not, I'm human. Nobody likes to lose five figures in, in, in the last seven days. You know? Ooh, five <laughs> figures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh you, boy. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that. What's the when you when you normally go to the casino, what do you normally what what hand limits do you normally play? What uh like what how five ten? I, I always play five ten. I don't know what they even have. Yeah, 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 yeah. I play five ten. Okay, that's perfect, perfect, good deal. Yeah, now, is all, there a, good. yeah, yeah. And then the last part is the connection. So uh, so it's also related to that too, because if you don't have relationships, you don't have the right people in your life to support you, then it's gonna be rough uh for you to get through it. Sometimes it could be financial. Sometimes it could be emotional. There were there were times where like when I went through like I actually got married and divorced twice, <laughs> and that's and that's when I got divorced the second time. I went through like a six month depression where I just didn't want to do anything. I want to check out in my life. Uh, yeah. So that's why having the right people to lift you up is so important. Austin. Awesome. Now, awesome. do you, do you get do you get stopped on the street a lot? I mean, do you, when people, when you're walking by, do you normally wear a hat? Or, I mean, you're, you're quite recognizable face, obviously. I mean, what uh, when you go out? Like, obviously, not now with the crisis, but when you in, in I don't know where you live. Are you, are you in San Francisco still? Or are you in California or LA? Where you where you live now? Um, LA. Okay, so I mean, well, LA is probably chock full of celebrities. But do you get stopped when you go out, or how does that work? Uh, uh well, sometimes people do um, ask me like. Oh hey, I recognize you. Aren't you that she banks guy? <laughs> <laughs> and then usually they just ask for like pictures. Okay. Was there, was there any what was the most would you say looking back, the most unusual request you had from somebody to do something? You were just like, nah, I'm not gonna do that, or a fan said something, or any any cool stories on that or something you could share? Yeah, of course. Um, I remember one time I was in Hong Kong. And there was this uh, middle-aged gentleman. Uh, he would rush, rush, he saw me from behind, and then he ru ran all the way to the elevator, got down on his knees to beg me for a picture and autograph. He, he was begging you, like, oh, my, like for mercy? That's yeah, cool yeah, 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 he Rushing. got down on his knees. Yeah, 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 he was running all the way to catch me before the elevator door closed. Oh, wow, <laughs> wow. <That's laughs> Now, if, if if they had a go ahead, Beck, go ahead. I was gonna say, so how does that feel that the impact you made on people's lives like that? How does that make you feel? Uh, I I, like, I like, feel I feel I feel amazing. I I feel mm -hmm. that, that there is some you know. I even though I'm still uh, figuring out the exact impact I want to make, I know mm -hmm. that that uh, I'm I'm doing something great uh, great for the world. Um, one interesting uh, the, the in, uh, app that I want to mention is Cameo. Uh, and the reason I want to mention this one is yeah, because uh, it's I've where, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I got a lot, a lot of requests recently from fans, like to awesome. do birthday songs, to do she bangs, to do inspirational messages, to do a mixture of all those things. Uh, and I got like hundreds of requests in the last few months. It's crazy. Wow. That's cool, man. Well, That's really we, awesome. You know, Cameo has exploded recently. For some reason, I, I think what what they're doing is what I've gathered is they're starting to advertise on people's timelines because I've seen the little uh, the advertisements on Facebook. And my uh -huh. one buddy, my, the one buddy, uh, my one buddy RJ, he got the there's this comic from the '80s. He got his wife paid him, and you just give him that he do do a little shout out. It's really cool. All right, all right, good deal, man. So, uh, how where can people uh, find your book, and how can people you know get a hold of you if they want a motivational speak? Give us all your contact info and all that. Yeah, the best. Uh, places to uh, go to willhung.com w-i-l-l-h-u-n-g dot com you can also find me on Facebook Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter Outstanding okay. man well, any, any other questions Pat before I list or Hungo? Um, no I, I think I'm good I, I just want to say thanks again for like I said your inspiration for us because we have we have day jobs and we always wanted to have a person you know pursue in comedy we both did um, comedy and I mean, pursue entertainment we both on stand up yeah, and, yeah. and um we we you know we uh you're kind of an inspiration for us because you just went out there and did your thing and 
didn't let anybody, uh, you know, bring you down. You're like, you know, just keep doing your thing. This is what we're trying to do with our podcast, you know. So we, we, right. we avoid we avoid all the haters. That. Yeah, <laughs> just keep going, man. Good deal. Before we go, can you say, uh, "This is William Hong. You're listening to the Square Table Degenerates <laughs> Podcast." Sure. Hey, this is William Hong, and you're listening to the Square Degenerate Table Podcast. All right, All right. outstanding. Thank you, Mr. Hong. Appreciate yeah, you joining you us. And, uh, we're we're going to air this on Friday if you want to watch it. And uh, thanks for joining us, man. Good best of luck with your book, and hope uh, yeah, good luck in the future. Okay. Uh, thank you. And good luck to you. And then best of luck to you and your. Oh, oh. Sorry, I was going to say, you know, stay healthy and hope you and your family are stay healthy and, you know, through all this, be strong through all this. Thank you. All right, well, stay stay we'll, we'll talk stay to you later. Take it easy now. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs> Batman brought up the rear nice there, right? Good job, Pat. Yeah, Pat's growing a little bit in his interview skills, but it is what it is on that. But man, after after that show, we just took off, dude. We uh, obviously the McNeely interview was the was a big one, man. That interview just popped. That was the first. And he, kept, man, besides the Buff Bag, well, that might be the only one I really had that went viral, viral. Seventy five hundred views as of now, but yeah, that it was because of the anniversary of the Tyson fight too. But yeah, the McNeely interview was insane. But we just started getting guest after guest. I was just I was going ham on Facebook. I actually got blocked one time because I was sending the same message too many times, but. You know, and I got uh, some of the interviews. We didn't get to see too much. There was this this linebacker. He played for the Jets. I think he was drafted by the Jets. Well, you find out in the interview. He played for Ohio State. His name was Anthony Schlegel. This is a cool interview. I like this one. One, because it was never seen too much. It was on a Sunday, and it was random. I should have aired it on a Friday. But two, there's a lot of outdoorsy stuff in this interview. So you guys are really going to like this one. I think uh, This is one of my favorites. It's uh, never really been seen before. Stand by. All right, welcome back, everybody. We're live with another special episode of the Square Table Degenerates podcast. I know normally we're on Fridays, but, uh, you know, schedules are what they are. We're joined today by Mr. Anthony Schlegel, former Ohio State linebacker. How are you today, sir? I'm doing great, brother. How you doing? Not too bad. It's uh, a little chilly up here as we were just talking. It's uh, actually quite cold. I'm sure uh, you're freezing right now, too, down there in Columbus, right? Oh, yeah. It's uh, What is it? It's 43. It's supposed to get a lot warmer um at the end of the week so i like it cold i like i like fall i like to know that there's a season I'm from texas and it's like summer to i don't know what you would call it because it's not a winter it's not like up here so you don't really get the seasons like you do up here so i enjoy them plus it's deer season so right now november november 2nd next three weeks deer are going to be moving so i'm, I'm always juiced about that Okay, do you do the the bow and the the was it rifle season two or what's it called? Yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm mainly a bow guy. You know, okay. I, just, I just enjoy it. You know, I got a lot of, being outside. A lot of my buddies in the guard used to uh, love the deer hunting and all that. I never I never got into it just because I'm too lazy and I'm from the city. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. So uh, I was checking on your Wikipedia page. It says you were born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, in '81. That's right. Uh, now, did you grow up in Iowa, or is that just uh, – where, where did you move to Texas? Yeah, so I was born in Iowa. My dad coached at a uh, small college there. He's the head coach at um, Poe College. And then when I was about three, we moved to we moved to Lufkin, Texas, on the, in the east, far east side of the state, and then moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area when I was about six. And then I grew up – really grew up there. Okay. Yep. So, so in high school, were you? Uh, how was how was it growing up in Texas? Were you just destined to play football? Like, what did you do in high school? Your class clown. I saw you wrestled for a little bit. Yeah, I wrestled. I wrestled from about six to eighteen. I actually had more wrestling scholarships than I did football scholarships. You know, I mean, it was different back then, late nineties. We didn't have the camps, they didn't have the stars, they didn't have that kind of stuff. You just kind of went to one day camps and did some stuff, and you know, uh, so wrestling was kind of my trade uh but yeah linebacker I always grew up and my dad was a football coach so it was Anthony Schlegel fullback that was that's how I introduced myself and then I learned about Dick Buckus and it was all over from there I wanted to be a linebacker so it was Anthony Schlegel linebacker so that's kind of how that started but 
you know, wrestling is such a great sport. I know up in Cleveland, I mean, you got St. Ed, St. Ignatius, um, great wrestling programs. Wrestling to me is what really made me into a football player because not just the leverage and the ability to handle your body, but more of the me versus you mentality, which really part of my game when playing football. Oh, for sure, for sure. Now, at what point in high school did you decide you were going to go to the Air Force Academy? Did you wh Where did you visit before you decided to pick the AFA? Well, you know, back then, wrestling, uh, I didn't have a lot of scholarship offers. I mean, I had SMU, and they were not very good. I had Missouri, and they were not very good. I mean, this was Missouri, late 90s Missouri, right? So not not, not really good. And I really love the military. So I had the three academies, and I liked Air Force the best. They had the best football program. And I was like, boom, there you go. That's it. Okay. Now, did, what, what, why did you uh, decide to at first start there? Was your you from a service family? Did you, uh, so you did, was your dad in the service thing like that? You just no, decided. No, like my dad's just a high school coach, man. Just, you know, attacking and dominating. And it was, uh, I, I, I couldn't be a pilot because I couldn't, couldn't see very well. So, it was going to be a combat controller, which is what I wanted to do. And I was like, you know, let's go here and play ball and get out and serve. And, you know, that's that was kind of why I went there. Okay, okay. I was actually going to ask you that. Well, you're going to be a combat controller. Okay, good deal. That's a rough school, man. I know, I knew some buddies, uh, not directly, not not guys I've talked to in a while, but they were combat controllers. And that's, uh, boy, that's a crazy, that's a whole other world right there. Yep. How, how did you like uh, Colorado Springs out there, the whole uh, Denver area, or the whole – just Colorado in general. Yeah, Colorado's nice. I mean, you can drive 75. I mean, it's pretty easy to get to, right? I mean, I think it's – is it 75? Let's see. I, I forget the highway. I want to say it's 75. And it just goes up to Wyoming. And, you know, we had guys – I went to the prep school first because that was kind of like my redshirt year. So I went to the prep school and kind of learned what the academy was all about. Didn't really have to do that. I just wanted to redshirt. So I'd come in and play as a freshman. And that's what I did. I started as my freshman year. But uh, it was just – it was a great experience. I mean, the academy is a good place to go be from, difficult place to go to. And uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, enjoyed my, I enjoyed my time there. Definitely a lot of the core values that I learned while I was at the academy are still my core values today. Okay. What made you decide to transfer to Ohio State at the time? <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, I, I left with – there was no portal. There was no, hey – you know, you're going to come here. Like, I left, and I left because, you know, my freshman year, I was an absolute turd. I mean, in a, in a good way, I thought, right? And I had a lot of insubordination hits and demerit. Because I was trying to – I mean, you want my, my stuff, you know, ironed and on the rack, no problem, right? You want me to go to school and take seven classes in aeronautical engineering, engineering mechanics? Sure, no problem. Uh, but it was – my freshman year, I was playing linebacker at 205, so I went to basic training at about 238, and now I'm starting as a freshman linebacker weighing 205. I can't get any type of extra food. And and then also being a turd, having all those demerits, no problem. I worked through it. I sat in my room for confinements for six months. And then my sophomore season, I got hurt, and I never missed a practice, and I would go off campus and get treatment. Well, they asked me, hey, have you been off campus? And I, I went off campus without permission because they wouldn't let me go, and I wanted to play. So I was like, yes, sir, I went off campus, and, and here's where I went to. And, you know, yeah, I also stopped off and got Chipotle and ate two bowls of Chipotle, and then I got back on and did my schoolwork and went to bed and got up and went to class. And so they tried to bring some of the, the stuff that I did in my freshman year back. And I was like, nope, that's not right. I did all that stuff. You said it was gone. It, was, it almost became like a, you know, just I wasn't going to do it. Right? I already did it all. And, and right. I, loved, I loved it there. I was a team captain as a sophomore. had a bunch of accolades. but And the guys on the team knew what was going on, and it was kind of ridiculous. And um, so I talked to Fisher DeBerry. He's like, yeah, I'm leaving. He's like, why? I was like, it's the principle of the thing. I did exactly what everybody told me to do. I did it to the best of my ability. I mean, if you need some, if you need a ten-mile stretcher run and nobody else can run it, guess what? I, I'll I'll take the front. You know, you guys rotate on the back, right? You need somebody who can't get up a hill. Give me all their gear and that person. I'll take them up the hill, so I can go to those levels. But in this, in, in terms of this, like I, I just couldn't get around it. So 
I ended up leaving, did not know anything about what school I was going to go to. And my D coordinator at the time at Air Force coached Mark D'Antonio at South Carolina where he played, right? And a lot of people don't know this, but Mark D'Antonio went to Army first and transferred to South Carolina. And then um, Ed Warner was my offensive line coach, and he recruited Ohio because he went to Mount Union. So kind of that, you know, those things all fall into place. They brought me up for a recruiting trip, and then I met Jim Trestle and Bobby Carpenter and A.J. Hawk, and I was like, these dudes are just like me, and this culture is just like the Air Force Academy. I'm talking about the brotherhood, and I've been all over the country at different universities, and the culture and brotherhood at Ohio State is by far the most similar. It's not equal. There is no equal to a military-type brotherhood, but from a from just regular dudes, it's by far the most similar, and that's why I chose to be a Buckeye. Nice. And this just occurred to me, but I was thinking of that one poster you guys had. I don't know if it's a poster, but the picture where you're, you know, you're doing the, the face in the yeah, middle. Yeah. Of the now, yeah. from from the from the time you, how long did it take you to grow out the hair? Did you start growing your hair the second you transferred out of the Air Force Academy, or how long well, did you? We, uh, we, um, we grew it out for Pat Tillman. So Pat oh, Tillman okay. in the NFL, right? He had long hair when he was with uh, the Arizona Cardinals. And he got killed in action, and we were like, you know, like that was a, that was a bad dude. Like when you're when you're an athlete, you don't really necessarily watch teams; you watch guys, right? Guys that you want to emulate, guys that you like their game and respect their game. So he was one of those type of guys, right? A walk-on guy at Arizona State, made a name for himself on special teams, was playing, uh, intense guy, served his country. I was like, yeah, let's, let's grow our hair out, kind of in respect for for what he did and, and how he carried himself. So that's how it started. Okay, okay. So what was it like first stepping out into the horseshoe, 104,000 screaming yeah. fans? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a different ball game coming from the Air Force Academy and playing in the Mountain West Conference and you go to 100, 104,000 people, all Buckeye fans and all sorts of message boards or whatever talking good and bad about you. Um, you know, it was just one of those things like, you know, this is big time college football. Right. And my dad being a high school coach, taking his kids that he coached all over the country. I got to be in some really good atmospheres, but there was nothing like Ohio State on game day. And it was just it was cool to go out there just with your guys. Right. Because it was us versus everybody else. And to be able to go out there and start and play just uh, meant a lot. Really, really awesome experiences. Now, did you know right away you were going to start at middle linebacker when you were transferring in, or did you have to compete? What happened there? Yeah, there's no, there's no you start right. I mean, um, they had, and everybody when I was getting recruited was like, "Why are you going to Ohio State?" You know, they have Bobby Carpenter, AJ Hawk, Mike DeAndrea. You know, I'm like, I want to go where the best are. That was it, and so there was no guarantee whatsoever. You had to earn it. Matter of fact, there was the, the no portal, and so I had a red shirt my first year. So that year, my entire goal was just to make Jim Bowman yell at me all practice because it wasn't like I was a walk on. I was a freshman all American in all conference. Like I'm going to play ball. And if you don't like how I play ball then kick me out of practice, I will get a pump time in the weight room and call it a day, you know, and that mm-hmm. happened quite frequently. Okay. I was going to make them better. You know, sometimes that didn't go over well. Okay. How was playing under Trussell? Was he uh, – was it a different style from the Air Force Academy? Or was it kind of, I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but in terms yeah, of like – He's very similar to Fisher to Barry. Very even keel. Um, unbelievable at the relationships. I mean, I, I still talk to Tress all the time. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I hit him up the other day. Just said, hey, Coach, just wanted you to know you're on my heart. I'm thinking about you, you know. And he's that, he's, he's that type of guy. When I went back to get my MBA while I was an assistant strength coach at Ohio State, you know, he wrote a letter of recommendation for me. I had him and Urban and, and Gene Smith. It's like, you know, I call him up and, you know, hey, here's what I need or what do you need from me, right? It's reciprocal. And we do – I love coming up to Northeast Ohio and doing events up there because of the man that Jim Trussell is. Oh, yeah. Trussell is awesome. Oh, he's awesome, man. Now, was that, that 2004 year, your first year at Ohio State, was that a little bit of a letdown compared to what you thought it was going to be? Because, 
I remember the, like that Northwestern loss. We had oh. Ohio State lost to Northwestern like a hundred years or some shit. Seven years. Oh yeah. Oh, that was bumpy. You know that season. It was. Uh, you know, I think I think sometimes you get kind of. <clears throat> excuse me. You win a national championship in 02. 03, you get beat by Michigan. I think we lost to Wisconsin. And you go, you still go to the Fiesta Bowl, right? So you kind of get accustomed to national championship, Orange Bowl, right? The Fiesta Bowl. Hey, we can go out there. And we didn't perform. We lost three in a row. We went three and three. And then we kind of turned it around. Uh, Zwick got hurt. Troy came in. And, and after the Iowa game, which was our third loss, and we were, you know, I wouldn't say we we're gonna we were playing well on defense, but having a little bit of identity and threats on offense, and they were all very young at that time. Uh, we started to turn it around and figured it out a little bit. We got by Purdue uh, at the end of the game, which I'm still upset about that that we got beat by them. But we ended up going five and one to finish the year. So I think we finished eight and four that season. But it was really after that we knew what we needed to do to get ready for 2005, and I think everybody did that. Oh, yeah. Now, beating, uh, to, to encapsulate the season, you guys came back and you, you beat Michigan. Did that feel good? Right. It was pretty, pretty handy, uh, handy to few handed them there. How did, how did that, oh, yeah. that feel awesome just, just whoop them when they came into Columbus? I think it was 37-21, and, you know, that game, like they were, they were like seventh in the country, right? going to be the outright Big Ten champions if they beat us, go to the Rose Bowl. I think they still end up going to the Rose Bowl that year. But in that game, I, I remember Earl Bruce coming and talking to the team before the game. And he, you're sitting there and he's spitting on you. And, and you know, I played in, you know, versus Navy, versus Army, and those military for the commanders and chief trophies. And that's special because of what it represents in the armed services. Right. But there's nothing like the game playing Michigan, and then at home in 2004, and it wasn't the season that you wanted, but you have an opportunity to right the ship by beating those guys, and we were able to do so, and it was, I mean, it was an unbelievable feeling, only capped by beating them the next year at their place. Oh, yeah. Now, 2005, was that your, that was your senior year? That was officially your senior year, right? Yeah, yeah, official. Yep. Now, did you, okay. Do did you, did you think it was going to be something special with you, Hawk, and uh, – Bobby Carpenter coming back for that one last year, man. That was that was a, that was awesome. That was probably. I mean, I, I'm not the the biggest Buckeyes fan in the world. I mean, I went to Kent State and all that, but I obviously root for you guys. But uh, I mean, I just I, you'll never. I'm never going to remember a linebacking core that good in college football. I mean, it was just amazing coming yeah, together. Yeah, there was uh, you know three guys all the same year together, very similar but very very different. Uh, we knew we were going to be good, and we defensively. You know, that's the other thing in 2004, you had Mel Tucker and Mark Snyder as the co-defensive coordinators that year, taking over after D'Antonio. So they had to kind of find their mix, and it took a little bit of time. And then Haycock took over in 2005 and really went back to a lot of what Dino did. And we had a great grasp on the, grasp on the defense. And I think that that's really where it started. Like, we knew each other's fits, and we also knew – that we could utilize Bobby in a different manner. And a lot of people don't know this, but we ran basically a 3-3-5 predominantly. I mean, for the, for probably 80% of the season, but Bobby was a rush end, right? And we had a nickel back in Dante Whitner that could stop the run. And we have somebody like Dante. I mean, he's from Cleveland oh, yeah. who, can, who can shock and shed a linebacker, you know, that lines up wide. I mean, that's a – unbelievable asset. So I think the, the, the key pieces were there in that season for us to make a run. And it, I mean, that was, that was a really unique year. I mean, it was the first big time out of conference game versus Texas at home. Like nobody had really done that before. And that was super cool to be a part of. I mean, I was just going to ask about that. Go, having Vince Young and everybody come into Columbus. I mean, Vince Young probably maybe one of the best college seasons of all time coming into you guys. Right. Yeah, they, they had to just cut the electric. I mean, they had to. Was that was that kind of equal to almost the game, or was that? I mean, in terms of like games of your career, like big, you know, whatever. Oomph. 
But so would you yeah, say it's pretty, pretty much up there? I would say behind. I mean, we got. I mean, we got beat. You know, I mean, right, we right. got beat two games that year. Um, you know, that game and that season, uh, Texas and Penn State, we got beat. Uh, I'll start with the Texas game, but that game. We had three turnovers inside their 25 yard line to start the game and got three points. You can, regardless of who you are, how good the matchup is, you can't beat any type of team when that happens. Right. And and we allowed him to stay in the fight. And he's a great quarterback. Right? He he threw for 221 and had a little bit on the ground, but nothing. I mean, we definitely held him to his lowest totals all season in that game. But just the magnitude of that game. I mean, I there was 100,000 people in the stadium. There was 200,000 people outside. I mean, we oh, were yeah. stuck on the bus. I'm like, listen, open it up. I'm walking back. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm going. I mean, I'm not waiting. I'm trying to get through the, the, the masses to get back to the Woody. I'll just walk back. But uh, it was a really special game, one that I remember. And then Penn State, oh, man, I think it might have been one of the first whiteouts, right? And yeah. – and we they ran a kickoff back to start the third quarter, and we three and out them. They kicked the field goal, and then we three and out them for the rest of the entire second half, and we got beat. And we only gave up 170 yards total offense that entire game, and we got beat 17 to 10. Like yeah. that still bothers me. So those two games, I mean, I would love to have had the opportunity to play USC in the national championship. I mean. At the end of the year, we were playing as good as anybody in the country, which is I think we finished fourth right behind Penn State. But that was a tough one, man. That was a good squad. That, 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 old, five, that old five squad, I'd say that might even be – I mean, in the times I've seen Ohio State, that might be one of the best. I mean, just that defense alone, I mean, with you and just all the other linebackers and then just on uh, – oh, Ted Ginn was on that team too, wasn't he? And Troy Smith. Oh, yeah. oh Ted, <laughs> Ted, Troy, Gonzo. Uh, San Antonio, I mean, oh, I Patrick, Antonio. yeah, I mean, unbelievable. Nick Mangle, Rob Sims, who's from Northeast Ohio. I mean, just deep, deep. Oh, well, those, who were some of your favorite teammates when you played at Ohio State? I mean, you still keep in contact with Trussell. You still, you still keep in contact with all those guys you just mentioned. Who were some of your favorites back then? Oh yeah, I mean, from a player's perspective, Dante was a fierce competitor. Man, he was awesome. I actually. Connected with him on LinkedIn. I mean, and you know, everybody kind of goes their separate ways, but they always kind of gravitate back to Columbus, Ohio. And you look now, like where we are, AJ lives in Dublin. I live in Worthington. Bobby lives in Upper Arlington. Lauren Itis lives in, you know, Dublin, right? So, I mean, these guys all come back, and then guys that I coach are moving back. And when guys come back in town, right, you hook up and you talk and you know, that's what it's about. You know, Nate, Sally, he's out in – Nate Nate was a phenomenal – I mean, Nate and um, Rob Sims, great guys. You know, they don't live here, you know, presently, but you still are connected to them because they're your Buckeye brother, you know? Yeah. Okay. Now, when you were getting ready for the NFL draft, did uh, did you have a feeling you were going to be selected? Did you – like, did it, they, well, who did you work out for pre-draft? What was your – Gut feeling going into the draft. I had no clue, you know, somewhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, before the season, it was like sixth, seventh round, free agent. I had no clue where I was going to be drafted. Okay. And, uh, but, you know, the beauty of Ohio State and the beauty of being with Bobby and AJ is like we just trained ourselves. So we went in there, whenever the team wasn't in there and lifted, they were making a transition. They were blowing up the Woody, they were doing some renovations and stuff. So we were working out in this place called the yard, which is they put our weight room behind chain link fence in the indoor. Like that's where we worked out. That's where we trained. Right. And, uh, you know, guys would go to different locations. I went up to Cleveland and met with Eric Lichter, who became the head strength coach at Ohio State, just to pick up some nuggets, right, on different technique. And we just trained for the draft together, you know, and because uh, we knew each other. We knew how to train. We enjoyed training with each other. So it made a lot of sense for us that that's how we're going to do it. How did you find out when the Jets drafted you? And what did you first think you got to call, to call or what, how did they call what was the method back then? Yo, man, these are great questions, man. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it it was they just call you, right? I mean, there's no, like, I mean, I didn't have any kind of party. I just had my family over, you know, and uh, I, was, I was already married. So we just had some of my relatives over hanging out at the house. Like, 
and it was two day draft, right? It was one through three, then four through seven. So I had no clue. So we were just sitting there watching it. I actually took a nap somewhere in the midst there. And then I kind of woke up and then I, I got a call. And it's like, hey, you're being, we're going to select you in the third round. I was like, all right, that sounds great. You know, and I called up Rabel. And I told my dad, I was like, listen, if I get selected first day, I'm taking you to golf at Muirfield. So then I had to call up Rabel and say, hey, Braves, I need to get on Muirfield tomorrow because I promised my dad if I got drafted first day that I'm going to Muirfield. And he did it. He hooked it up. Nice. Now, uh, when you went back to Ohio State as the strength and conditioning coach, how did that come about? Who, uh, was that uh, not, or was that Irving contacting you? Who was the coach back then? Yeah, that was Trust. That was Trust. Okay. Yeah, that was. Uh, it's actually a funny story. So one of their assistants left, took the Kent State job as the head strength coach, and so he called me up. I was like, "Hey, do you want to?" You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I just got done playing. I was back in Texas, out of the league. I was training. Um, some, you know, high school division two kids at, at the gym that I grew up at, this old school meathead gym called Metroflex. And, um, you know, really enjoyed strength and conditioning. So he was like, well, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm training these kids. He's like, hey, do you want to be a strength coach at Ohio State? I said, that sounds cool, you know? He's like, well, you got to interview first. I'm like, all right. So they were in town for the American Football Coaches Association Conference. And Fick was down there. And so Tress said, hey, your interview is with Luke Fickle. I said, well, that's a slam dunk, you know. I got right. that. But he's like, no, you have to take him hog hunting. So my job interview to be a straight coach at Ohio State, I took Luke Fickle hog hunting in Texas at night with dogs and a knife. And he ended up killing a pig, which is fantastic. And, nice. uh, and I, got, I got the job. What? How, what uh, did you guys get some burgers or what did you did you cook this hog? How did you eat the hog? Did yeah, you... I mean, I mean, we put on a smoker, but I mean, we didn't eat it. Like I back then, uh, I always did homeless outreaches okay. in downtown Fort Worth. I mean, I've killed probably seven hundred wild pigs with a knife in my day. So we would oh, take them out, process them, and skin them, and then we'd go to downtown Fort Worth and set up shop at a you know side corner place where we. It was actually a haunted house, and we, we knew the owner, so we could use the parking lot, and we would just feed people wild game and catfish. It was awesome. Okay. Good deal. Only in Texas, man. Only in Texas. Right. Now, people, what? People were even like, what, what are you guys doing? <laughs> now, when you uh, slam this guy on the field, I, I forgot about this. What is, what Describe this incident when this guy runs on the field and you just body check him to the ground. What happened with it? Yeah, it was uh, – well. I had the worst job in college sports. It's called, well, there's two jobs. One's the get back coach. Get back coach just tells all the guys and coaches to get back. So all you do is yell, get back for three hours. Horrible job. When you move up and you're the associate director, right? So you're like, you're not the head guy. You're below the head guy, right? Like that's your job title. Right. You then get elevated to, you're the strength coach responsible for the special team substitutions. What a horrible job. You're not in the meetings. You have no authority whatsoever. If a kid doesn't go out there to like reprimand them, take away playing time, you have no, no, like no authority whatsoever. So your job is to make sure that they're on the sideline, ready to go. You call punt, everybody, you count them up, right? Bad thing is on pump block, they have like five different colors and all different personnel. And they just handed you this personnel sheet literally 45 minutes before the game. And you're just like, what? When did you guys come up with this? Like, how many do you really need? I played in the NFL. Like, we didn't even have this many. So I'm in this game. I was so paranoid because I didn't want my face to get melted off by Urban Meyer that I'm out there counting up the guys that I had on offense because those are the ones that are the most difficult because they could be talking to a coach, go back to the bench, et cetera, et cetera. I had three guys on the field. They were all out there. I counted them up. They were good. Then all of a sudden I saw this guy. I, I really didn't even know if it was a dude or what. I saw this person running towards our bench, and nobody was doing anything, nothing. And this person just getting closer. And so I look at Mick who's our head strength coach. I look at Mick. He looks at me. I look back at this guy. I look at Mick, and I swear he gave me, like, kind of one of the, like, 
You know, like, what are you going to do? Well, man, I was a national champion wrestler, and I played in the NFL as a linebacker. Like, it doesn't take me much to flip the switch. Right. He gave me the eyebrows. I just went out there and lateral dropped it, you know? And people don't think about this, but, I mean, I'm out there with my call sheet, my depth chart, pair of khakis and some, you know, tennis shoes. Like, what happens if I ever got juked out by a drunk guy in Sparrows, you know, former Ohio State linebacker? But it was just complete instincts, man. Just go out there. There's a guy running toward our bench that shouldn't be there, and nobody's doing anything. And he gave me the eyebrows, and I flipped the switch and attack and dominate. Nice. Now, was this uh, – it was 2014 I read. Was that before or after you uh, ended up finishing your MBA at Ohio State? Uh, that was before, yeah. So I graduated that following May. Okay, okay. Yep. We had a viewer question. It says, have you ever heard of Uncle Steve's Shake Barbecue Rub out of Texas? No, I haven't. It sounds amazing, though. <laughs> okay, we'll have, to, we'll have to see what's up with that and a link or something like that. That's awesome. No, you, yeah, Uncle Steve's Shake Barbecue Rub out of Texas, it said. All right, now you got a radio show on the fan in Columbus, uh, I, I read. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It's uh, it's morning juice. Oh, so you, got the, uh, you got the 6 to 10 slot then? Yeah, so we uh, we are actually six to nine. So okay. I don't know. There's just something about linebackers in Columbus, Ohio. So it's Bobby Carpenter okay. and Brandon Beam and myself from six to nine. So when they made that switch from Golic and Wingo, they were like, "Hey, we're going to go live and local for the first time in 20 years." I said, "Okay, attack and dominate." You know what do you need? Right. And and I oh by the way, you're going to be doing it with Bobby. I'm like, well, that would be hysterical. You know, I mean, just us two talking ball, and Bobby actually did his NBA with me, and um, and in this in this sport, like I invented a product while I was at Ohio State, and uh, basically I took the premise of a football sled and made it completely portable, able to use for all ages, right? So my eight year old can use it, but so does like I just sold two of them to Bill Belichick from New England Patriots, and Mike Tomlin has one in his basement for his kids, and. So we're I got 28 NFL teams that use my stuff and 100 Division One colleges, and so I know all these people. I, I've seen every program. I've been out there. I'm always in the game of ball. It's like, oh, we're gonna go talk ball all the time for three hours a day with my buddy. Like that sounds good, you know. Right, right. So yeah, so we just bring the juice every single morning, man. Just trying to get people ready to go into work and, and attack and dominate. Do you like you like the radio better than uh, being the strength and conditioning coach? Sounds like you had a lot more. Uh... A lot more hyper or a lot more uh, enthusiasm in your voice when you talk about the radio as opposed to the assistant special teams get up coach or whatever that <laughs> was. Well, you know, being a strength coach, people don't really realize this. I mean, the coaching profession is very, very difficult. Uh, you got to go move. I mean, if you want to go be the head duck, like there's only one head strength coach at Ohio State. There's only one job. Like, right. what's the best alternative, right? Ohio Dominican, Capital. You know, so you have to move. Right? You have to take your entire family like, hey, we're going to go move to this place to go hitch your wagon to this coach, this head coach, to be his guy. Right. And when I got out, you know, and I always evaluated people like this, like, does the coach know ball? Can he recruit? And is he a good dude? Hard to find all three. Trust was all three, right? Urban, all three. Hard to find a guy like that at the right fit at the right school to give you that opportunity. So when I was getting my MBA after we won the national championship, I had some opportunities to go be a head strength coach to power five schools. And I was just talking to my wife, like, is this something that we want to do as a family? And the answer was no. So I, I resigned after we won the national championship, stayed on through May till coach Mick could find a replacement. And he did, and he did a great job. He found Brady Collins. And now Brady Collins is the head strength coach at Cincinnati with Luke Fickle. And, you know, it all worked out. So I started my business, The Difference USA. Boom. Go out there. I have two pads. I just basically make and sell stuff that I invent for football. And it's other sports too, but mainly that. And, And I do the radio. So it's fun. And I get to coach my kids and be at all their events and, be out in the community in, in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio. So it's, it's really good. I can. Now, do you, do you ever get sick of uh, people walking up to you and go, oh, H, like, I mean, that's. Yeah. Uh, 
it's I, a Buckeye thing, man. True, 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 true. I don't know. Yeah, it's one of those deals. I mean, you know, and I know you don't watch them a ton, Joe, but I mean, like, that's just what it is. I mean, if you say OH and they say IO, you do it three times, and everybody's juiced out of their mind with a smile on their face. Like, that's part of the gig. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the more the more liquor everybody has in, the more weed everybody has in, the more it's going to go. I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. You ever miss playing football? Oh, yeah. I mean, all the time. I mean, you know, it's – what do you love about football? Well, for me personally, I love the physicality of the game. Like, that was what I did. Like, I was a run stopper. Like, right. I want to I want to hit guards and running backs, you know. I was probably a decade and a half too late being born because I would have fit right in the early 90s and late 80s. But um, that was kind of my game, and the game started changing. And then, you know – Tight ends got bigger. I mean, I got Transaurus Rex arms. You know, I'm six foot one. And I got to go cover a six foot five, six foot six tight end that can run. Like that stinks, you know. So, you know, but that's why I became a strength coach because then I could kind of pass on that information, that knowledge of, hey, you know what? When I was playing linebacker at Ohio State, I was 250 pounds. Did not need to be that big. I should have been able to. I should have been 235. And been able to bend my knees and play in space and work on that crap because the game was changing. Nobody told me that, right? You'll learn those that learn those things as you go, which is why I became a strength coach. I just wanted to work with everybody. But now, you know, I coach my third graders, third and fourth grade football team with a former Buckeye named Ryan Miller, who has a kid on the team. And we just want to develop kids and teach them football and why football is enjoyable. And if you teach them the fundamentals of the game. They have success. And if you encourage them, they're going to want to come back and keep playing. Like that's, that's why. So I, I never stop coaching. I never stop bringing the juice, whether it's on the radio or, or doing this with you or coaching my kids. Like I'm like this from 6 a.m. in the morning to I put my head down at night. That's the same way I am. First thing I get up till, till the time I go to bed, it's on one speed and that's just go, man. It's the only way to operate in life. All gas, no break. Heck yeah. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Anthony Schlegel for joining us today. Catch up down on the fan, obviously, in Columbus. From, but we're up here at Cleveland. We've got 92 through the fan. But down there in Columbus, listen to the fan in the morning, 6 to 9. Appreciate you for coming out, my friend. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. All right. Take your easy now. Bye. I like that one, man. Schlegel was a good dude. I was, he was a, it was, I did it on a Sunday, and I think only Lepp was watching at the time. It was crazy. Now, uh, over the past two and a half years, there's been a lot of changes on the show, man. We've had uh, babies been born, relationships lost and gained, people passed away, RIP Pops. My dad has passed away since the show started. But uh, the, one of the earliest and best supporters of the show, a girl named Miss Janetta Doby, I used to work with her. She would be in the chat all the time. She was in, She flirted with Peter McNeely in the chat. That was great. She would always, sometimes it'd be just her and, you know, Tom's wife watching. Maybe just her watching sometimes. A great support of the show. She was on a couple of old shows. I didn't want to pull her up my camera because that made everybody cry again. But right around the time she started getting sick and was in the hospital, I contacted uh, Sean Stockman on Cameo and had his tribute video made for her. This is one of my uh, fit. It worked out really perfect. This is really, uh, really a good tribute. So get your get your hankies ready. This is... Uh, it's kind of a tearjerker, actually. This is it was this was so well done, man. I really fuck with this. I really dig this one. All right, let me pull this up real quick. Dobie, what's up? Or should I call you Janetta? I mean, I know we don't know each other like that, but you know, I thought that if I knew your nickname and because you know Joe Varel, one of your boys, and you know, the rest of your your folks call you that, I thought I was part of the gang. Yeah, you know I mean, just instantly. I hope I, I am. I hope I don't offend. You know what I mean? But um, just wanted to say hello. And I wanted to tell you that your folks, your friends, your family, they miss you terribly. And they're praying for you. And they want to see you again. So please keep that in mind as you go through your day. And hopefully you are inspired by that. And hopefully you're inspired, hopefully by this song. This song makes me happy, and I hope it makes you happy, too. When I wake up in the morning, I'm... and the sunlight hurts my eyes, something without warning, I'm... days heavy 
God bless you. See you soon. Damn, man. It, was, uh, it makes me cry every time, dude. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I really, really miss Toby a lot some days. For those of you who don't remember, this is Toby. That's what she looks like. It was me and her at Charles Moore's going away party from work. But uh, I love you and I miss you, Toby. I hope you're doing good up there. Now, uh, not to end everything on a somber note, but, okay, Pat is obviously a member of the show. You guys know Pat. And he did try the Packy One Chip, or Pocky, how the fuck you pronounce it, One Chip Challenge. This has never been before aired because, frankly, as you would wonder, it wasn't really a successful challenge, as you could see in this uh, video I'm about to air. Nobody's ever seen this before for a reason, but uh, take a look here in a second. <laughs> this looks great. We're back now. Pat wasn't here for the main one of the hockey chip challenge. So we're not gonna repeat, we're not gonna repeat the rules too much because you guys know what it's about. But basically, you gotta eat this one chip, and then we see the after effects. So here I'll show you the, the box from what it is. You all know what it's about. You all know what it's gonna do. So Pat, uh wait, hold on. We gotta get some you wanna put some gloves, you know you gotta put some gloves on or no? Uh, yeah. see, no, you, don't, you don't need to. We, we're putting gloves in. All right, so go ahead, man. I'll open up the chip and then we'll start the timer. I'll remember from when the time goes because I ain't nothing else going on here. So. so, Mr. Pat is opening up the chip. Ooh, look at this. This chip is so disgusting. Uh, I can't time. believe he's doing it. Thank you for the All right, and let me let me know when uh, I'll watch it here on the camera. When you're on. Down the hatch. Probably be exactly in a minute. Eat the whole thing or else it's not gonna, you're not going to be able to do it unless you eat the whole thing with one, one, one hatch. Oh fuck! Yeah, you better the whole thing, the whole thing down, down, bro. All right, wrong. Uh, stop pressuring him. You could kill him. You're not on camera, though. <laughs> so we, then, then, Dennis is off camera, so the kids are wondering what the deep guy's voice is from Detroit sounding. The clock doesn't start till you finish the chip, man. It's okay. <laughs> He's already finishing the heat, feeling the heat. He's not even started. This is ridiculous. I can't believe you still want to do this after all this. You think you'd watch the show and get the lessons from us doing it? And, he, and he's eating it a bit at a time too. He doesn't down the whole hash thing. This is delaying. It's literally the worst strategy I've ever seen for eating these chips. You might die or you're in the operating table. You can't bow out before you finish the. Don't even finish the. The clock's not even. I didn't think this through. <laughs> He's not even going to finish the whole chip. I know. I've been like that before. Like, <sighs> oh, fuck. This chip isn't cheap. You got to finish it, bro. Here. Here's some uh, paper towels for your hands. So you don't, you don't want to touch your eye or else your eye will fall out. Yeah, yeah there you go. Come oh. on. So the clock hasn't even started yet, ladies. So we're at negative whatever time it is because Pat hasn't uh, Pat hasn't finished the whole chip. Well, I am. I might have to drink something soon. Oh, finish the whole chip, then you can you can drink some. You got to finish the whole chip, or the challenge doesn't even count, though, for the Pocky Corporation. <sighs> They're very specific on their instructions, which is it's a are they huge list? Yeah, you got to eat the whole chip, or else your complete bitch it says, and then people tag you. And then you, uh, and a meme comes up and says, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Didn't even finish it, bro. You got to make the video at least YouTube worthy, Pat. Come on, man. Don't disappoint the show and your family. Your friends are watching all across the nation. Oh, this is bad. In the UK, even in fucking Canada, they're watching right now. Uh, Pat's uh, feeling it. He is feeling it. Oh, fuck. Right? Right to the dome. Can you believe it? You didn't even finish the whole chip. Look at it. 
Yeah. I can't, man. I can't. He's not even, he's not even gonna finish the whole thing. I can't. He taps out. He doesn't even start the clock, ladies and gentlemen. Look at that. Whatever he had. That was what look, he didn't, Oh my god. He didn't even eat one eighth of the chip. <laughs> wow. You should have done it with us because we did all because we were all crazy at one time. We were like, ah right, we just downed it right on the edge. So for those of you keeping score at home, Pat Zero, Pocky Corporation one. And we'll do it. Yeah, he's gonna need some milk because he uh yeah, he he didn't even try. <laughs> wow. Next time, if he shows up a tie bill, he'll yeah, we we if we would have done it like that. So if you're out there with the strategy, don't try to nibble on the chip like Pat did, because it's not gonna work. You're not gonna get counted. But yeah, at the end of the day, uh he at least he tried it, I guess. But we'll uh we'll talk to you later and uh be sure to subscribe if you're watching this. All right, bye. <laughs> Pat, tap it out. So if you ever want to make fun of Pat over me, definitely fucking do it because you saw the results when Pat tries it. Now, people may be asking yourself, one, is Joey Edibles in the chat? I don't know. I might be in the chat. Everybody's probably like, hey, Loaderman, hey, Eastwood Farms, hey, Bobby. And you're just saying hi to everybody 5,000 times. So me not being in the chat necessarily isn't really the whatever. Who cares at this point? But people may want to go, where's the show going from here? What are you going to do next? Who are you going to have on? I don't know. Whoever I get a hold of, really. It's a zero-sum game. Sometimes uh, people return messages. Sometimes they say they're going to be on, and it just takes a while. But at the end of the day, I want to thank every last one of you for tuning in for all 200 or 120-some episodes, probably 125, 130. After all the specials we've done everything, it's been really fun, man. I'm continuing this great vibe. We're all going to grow together here. I don't know about all of you. Some of you know, let's be real, some of these channels suck. But, hey, I mean... Fuck, uh, you know, you can't, can't, not every, uh, every blade of grass in the fucking lawn is going to grow. Some of it's going to die. Some people pee on some of the grass. It's going to just die there. Some of those YouTubers will stay there forever, but we'll see. Next week we have on Jen Jen, Jennifer Chandler. She's a local comedian here in Cleveland. Uh, if you haven't already, like and subscribe. And we do this every Friday, usually live. And like I said, next week we're going to be live. And thank you all for coming out, man. I really appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.